Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, I'd like to introduce our speaker for today, um, Dr. Karen Goodman. So um, she comes to us, she's Professor of Radiation Oncology and the Associate Director of Clinical Research at University of Colorado Cancer Center. Um, to talk about her training, she did her undergrad and medical school studies at Stanford University. I want to point out she was a research fellow at CDC, so she knows Atlanta well. Um, she also has a master's in public health from the Harvard uh, School of Public Medicine. Uh, she completed her internship in Stanford, residency at uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering um, Cancer Center, and she has been faculty at Stanford, Memorial Sloan Kettering, and now at um, University of Colorado Cancer Center. Uh, she, has, she is PI study chair of many national uh, trials um, in GI cancer, including those looking at the role of adjuvant radiation in pancreatic cancer, uh, pet-directed therapy for new adjuvant chemoradiation in esophageal cancer, and now the uh, large national trial uh, prospect trial for locally advanced rectal cancer. So, um, Karen, welcome. Great, thank you, Christine. Christina, that was a very kind welcome, and it's nice to have a multidisciplinary uh, setting here to talk about um, rectal cancer. Um, and as Christina mentioned, I was here in Atlanta 25 years ago as a uh, fellow at the CDC, and it's great to be back. I haven't been back in uh, on, on this campus in 25 years, and it was amazing to see the changes, and also what's the same, I went to Lullwater Park where I used to go running, um, and that hasn't changed, which is nice. So I was going to kind of talk about the changes that have gone on in the last 25 years or so in the management of rectal cancer, because there's been a lot of change in that area as well, and we've really been able to individualize therapy over the last 25 years, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about all of the options, as well as, oops, I left, over, left this, um, as well as, really focusing in on this idea of non-operative management. So I'm gonna start a little bit with a little bit of background of where we are now and where we've uh, been, and then talk about selective use of radiotherapy. Um, followed by that, we'll, we'll go into this total neoadjuvant or TNT approach to rectal cancer, and then uh, non-operative management. And then I just wanna sp uh, speak about short course radiation for a few minutes. Um, so I'm sure everybody is familiar with this 1990 NCI consensus statement, which was really based on um, years of evaluating the use of various combinations of adjuvant therapy after surgery for rectal cancer using radiation, chemotherapy, and the combination. And based on those years of, of research, they, the NCI came out with one of the first really risk-based um, recommendations for the treatment of rectal cancer, and this was that combined postoperative chemotherapy and radiation therapy improves local control and survival in stage two and three rectal cancer and is recommended. But I think we've come a long way in the last two to three decades with many things in terms of improvements of surgical technique, TME, which we'll talk about in a minute, our move to neoadjuvant therapy. Um, new chemotherapy agents, like saliplatin didn't, wasn't available in 1990, and many advances in radiotherapy planning and delivery. So things have really you know, progressed over the last 20 to 30 years, and so we really have to rethink what is the optimal therapy for rectal cancer. Um, I'll just mention the real landmark study in rectal cancer, which changed the approach from um, the adjuvant to the new adjuvant approach. Everybody's familiar with the German rectal cancer study, which looked at either pre-op versus, versus post-op chemoradiation for patients who had had a total mesorectal excision. Oops. No, what happened there? Oh. Um, and that showed a benefit in terms of um, both local control for, for preoperative therapy, um, decreased uh, toxicity with preoperative therapy, and also the ability to improve sphincter preservation. So that's really been our standard of care for, say, the last tw uh, 15, 20 years since the rec German rectal cancer study was presented. So just an overview of where we are now in 2018. Back in the um, you know, 1970s, that was a very, the approach was really surgery alone with this very blunt uh, dissection. We were seeing a lot of uh, local recurrences in those days. Um, and then the trials of adjuvant therapy. We had the NCI consensus statement in 1990, and then really the introduction of TME and the improvement in um, local control with better surgical techniques. The German rectal cancer study led to new adjuvant therapy. Then we had the addition of oxaliplatin in, to adjuvant therapy in the, um, in the early 2000s, and then evaluation of using oxaliplatin with chemoradiation, which really didn't pan out. And now I think we're really in a place where 
um, are we're seeing that um, local recurrences are quite low with these with our standard approach with neoadjuvant therapy followed by a TME. We're down to about four to six percent. Um, recurrence rates with that approach, but we're now seeing that distant recurrences actually are, um, are higher than our local recurrences, up to on the order of about 20 to 25 percent. So I think what we're trying to do now is really individualize therapy um, for our patients and really look at risk-based management, tailoring treatment to the needs of the patient. So things that we're going to look at are selective use of radiation, intensifying new adjuvant therapy for patients with more um, high-risk disease, and then the potential for non-operative management in patients who have, especially the low-lying rectal cancers, that uh, would really benefit from avoiding, um, say, a, an abdominal perineal resection. So just talking about selective use of radiotherapy, can, the first question that um, was looked at is, can we avoid radiotherapy in a subset of patients who have a negative margin after a total mesorectal excision? So just a quick reminder about what a TME is. So as I mentioned that uh, previous to the TME, we were doing these really blunt dissections. Uh, the surgeries were really not taking out the whole tumor uh, unblock with the lymph nodes around in the mesorectum. Um, and so the use of the TME is now really taking the whole tumor with the mesorectal, along the mesorectal fascia and then all the lymph nodes, and that has really reduced the uh, risk of local recurrence. So the question came up with improved surgical technique, is radiation really necessary? Um, and so this was a study that was done by the uh, British uh, Medical uh, Research Council. Um, and they looked at over 1,300 patients, and they randomized them to what was more standard in the UK, which was pre-op short course, um, versus um, surgery up front with a TME, and then selectively doing post-op chemo radiation for patients that had a positive margin. And this study showed that um, that it did it, uh, the, just selectively treating patients was not enough, and so there was still a higher risk of um, local recurrence in the patients that had the selective post-op radiation, 10.6 percent versus 4.4 percent, and this translated into a uh, worse uh, disease-free survival. Um, however, radiation does come at a cost. So um, in this study, they had a nice evaluation of um, quality of life and um, endpoints looking at a bowel dysfunction. They found that there was no difference in defecation dysfunction, but there was a higher rate of incontinence in the patients that received pre-op radiation. So that's always something we have to weigh is what are the risks and benefits of doing our therapies. Um, and what about looking at patients who've had upfront chemo and had a good response to, um, to new adjuvant chemo? Can we avoid radiation in those patients? And so this was a study we did at Memorial Sloan Kettering when I was there, um, looking at, at patients who got upfront Folfox, and we had bevacizumab as part of that treatment as well. Um, and then they were reevaluated. If they had no evidence of progression, they would go on to surgery directly. If there was any evidence of progression, we would allow, they would go on to chemo radiation. In this study, we had 32 patients that were enrolled. Um, there were two patients that had toxicity to the Fulfox who were switched over to chemo radiation, but all of the other patients completed the Fulfox and bevacizumab and went directly to surgery. Um, and this was a relatively, primarily younger group of patients. I, I, liked, I saw all the patients on the study, and I primarily really pushed our young women on that study because it was nice to be able to avoid uh, pelvic radiation in our younger women. Um, so we had, of all, all of the patients had an R0 resection, um, and 25% had a pathologic complete response, which was quite shocking. We all, everybody was surprised about what a high rate of path CR we were seeing with just chemo alone. This was full Fox and bevacizumab alone. Um, and to the, to, when we published this, um, there were uh, zero, none of the patients had a local recurrence, um, and there were three that had a distant recurrence. Um, they were all pulmonary metastases, um, and only one patient had died. So we saw really um, nice outcomes with this approach. And this really led to the development of the PROSPECT trial, which is evaluating the use of um, selective radiotherapy for patients. Um, and uh, in this study, we actually took out the bevacizumab, so it's just full FOX up front, um, and then reevaluation. And if they have a good response, they continue on to a, a surgery and then adjuvant full FOX um, versus the standard arm, which is just the standard pre-op chemo radiation followed by surgery. Uh, followed by adjuvant chemo. And this study, we're about 100, I heard just last week, um, about 120 patients to go to reach that full 1,000 patients. So we're getting, getting there. It's, you know, um, I think it's, it, these, these studies always take, always take longer than we hope, but we should be getting to the completion soon.
Now, what about the patients who really have more um, high risk, advanced disease that we're really concerned about? I mean, we probably don't want to be omitting therapy in these patients. Um, and in particular, a lot of our patients we're seeing now have a higher risk of distant recurrence. So there's been this, uh, in this over the last 10 years or so, a, a thought about moving that adjuvant therapy up front to really address micrometastatic disease early on. And this is particularly important in our patients who have high-risk disease with node-positive disease and also sometimes with bulky tumors. You can downsize them a little bit and then make it easier to get chemoradiation. So the next question is, how do, how, how do we use total neoadjuvant therapy? Can we improve outcomes by addressing this micrometastatic disease up front um, rather than using the, by, by using um, neoadjuvant chemotherapy rather than using adjuvant? Um, and this is sort of the standard regimen where we get um, pre-op chemoradiation, followed by surgery, followed by chemotherapy. But in many cases, patients don't get that adjuvant chemotherapy after surgery because of, of side effects. They don't tolerate it as well. So a large proportion of patients don't complete their adjuvant chemotherapy. So the thought is, is not only if we um, you know, bring it up front do we improve ability to treat micrometastatic disease up front, but we can also potentially get the chemotherapy in, in, uh, more effectively. And so this is really the new paradigm, this TNT approach of giving chemotherapy first, chemoradiotherapy, and then surgery. And there have, have been two phase two trials that have evaluated this induction chemotherapy approach um, in, in a high risk, high risk group of patients based on MRI. And I just want to mention a little bit about MRI because I think really we're starting to um, use this really routinely in the US, but in Europe they've been using MRI for staging for rectal cancer for years and they have really nice studies showing how effective MRI is for determining really the extent of the extramural tumor, so how far it extends through the wall, um, and can identify risk of the circum circumferential resection margin being positive. So they've done these beautiful um, radiologic and pathologic um, correlations and shown really nice correlation. <laughs> So um, in the UK and the Spanish trials, they use that MRI um, assessment and the risk um, to determine whether patients would be eligible for the, uh, the study. And these are just the descriptions of what the um, high-risk patients were based on uh, the MRI. And they're very similar. And essentially, you know, high-risk in terms of being close to the mesorectal fascia, large tumors, low tumors. Um, and uh, this is, I'm just going to go into a little more detail about these two UK trials, or the two trials. This is a UK expert trial. Um, there were 105 patients that were um, poor risk, and they were put on a single arm study with KPOX up front, followed by uh, CAPE and radiation, and then t um, the surgery, and then adjuvant KPOX. Um, of the 97 uh, patients who underwent surgery, there was a 20% path CR rate. And these are these really high-risk patients, um, which is impressive. And the three-year progression-free survival and overall survival were 68 and 83%, which was considered to be quite good for this high-risk population. The Spanish uh, trial was actually a, a randomized trial, a phase two randomized trial. Again, similar number of patients, randomized to either the um, standard chemoradiation, followed by surgery, followed by KPOX, or KPOX up front, chemoradiation than surgery. Um, and this study showed nicely that with the um, induction chemo, you could get a much higher um, compliance to full chemotherapy. So in the TNT group, you see 94% of the patients received their full chemotherapy. Also, there was less toxicity um, with the TNT approach with the chemotherapy. So it seemed like it was better um, tolerated. Um, there was no difference in outcomes for this, uh, in this study in terms of the five-year disease-free survival. However, um, uh, you can see that um, and there was a slight um, increase in uh, the, the cumulative incidence of local recurrence, but that was not statistically significant. But this was 108 patients, so you're really not expecting, you, for adjuvant trials, and you're not even changing the, you know, you're not removing any, any treatment, you're just changing sequencing, you wouldn't expect to necessarily see a change in the outcomes. But it shows that at least with induction chemotherapy versus adjuvant, you're not seeing any detriment. Um, at Sloan Kettering, we had been doing this approach for quite a few years as uh, just a standard institutional approach for our high-risk pati patients, and then we really moved it into pretty much all of our patients with rectal cancer. Um, and so this was our first review of our outcomes. This was um, a, a study looking just retrospectively at our patients, uh, 61 patients who received induction full FOX. Um, 57 of them did go on to get chemoradiation, and then 49 went on to get a TME. Um, and they were 100% had an R0 resection. We had a 27% path CR rate, 
and a greater than 90% treatment effect in 47% of the patients. So excellent um, outcomes in, uh, in terms of response. There were 12 that didn't undergo a TME, nine because they had such a good response to the induction chemo and chemo radiation that we decided to do um, watchful waiting. Um, and then so there were a total of 22 patients that either had a pathologic complete response and or a complete clinical response. So that's a really nice outcome with that um, upfront approach. Um, and of those patients, the nine who had non-operative management, um, seven remained NED without a local recurrence. And I'll talk a little bit more about the uh, non-operative ma uh, management in a minute. These are the updated results that were just uh, published in uh, JAM Oncology. Um, and this is looking at now 628 patients either who had uh, induction chemo followed by chemo radiation on the TNT approach or the standard chemo radiation followed by, adju by adjuvant chemo. Um, and I'll just mention here that, so you can see about 19% had a path CR, and then um, uh, there were 67 patients who had a sustained um, clinical CR at 12 months. Um, so, which is quite impressive. And then we have um, on the standard chemo radiation arm, we did have patients, 19 patients who were treated non-operatively in that group as well. Um, and these are just, again, showing that with the upfront approach, it's much more likely, oops, um, it's much more likely that patients receive the um, full dose of the um, full FOX if they receive it in the, in the new adjuvant versus the adjuvant um, uh, uh, setting. Um, and this is just showing that there was uh, a complete response rate, which was a path CR plus a clinical CR at 12 months uh, in 37% of the TNT patients versus 22% in the chemo radiation um, followed by adjuvant. But there was no difference in distant metastases, which was a little surprising because our hope was that was what we were going to affect. But again, you know, this is a, a retrospective um, uh, study, and so we really need to look at this in the um, more... Um, in, a, in a larger setting, and probably um, we'll see maybe some of these outcomes better in some of the prospective studies that are going on with um, the non-operative management. So now, this is just what we see in the NCCN guidelines. So we actually do have the approach of new adjuvant therapy, or TNT, in the NCCN guidelines. Um, so that is a uh, can be considered a standard approach now, even though it's interesting because we never actually did a head-to-head -head, um, randomized trial of the two approaches in a large, larger setting. Um, and so the other thing that we're doing now is we're really incorporating this approach of TNT into our national group studies, and it's being used as the backbone for um, some of our new studies. So this is the NRG GI002 study, um, which is looking at using in the induction chemo followed by chemo radiation as a backbone to add new agents. And so um, many of you, I think you guys have this open here. Um, you guys are aware that we have now um, a PARP inhibitor as one of the arms, and now the um, immunotherapy is going to be an arm too, and this should be opening, you know, as we speak. Um, so that's really exciting, and I think eventually we'll maybe, you know, continue to add um, options as uh, as they come up. And I was hearing from Christina that she has a potential um, uh, study of MEK inhibitor that may be. Um, Part of the study as well. Um, and then the question of surgery may be asked on this, um, in this setting as well. I think this is a really nice study to be able to con continue to look at new options for preoperative therapy. So what about timing after surgery to evaluate pathologic complete response? We really have seen over the years, you know, there was a early studies, the Lyon study that showed that it was better to do surgery and see evaluation, evaluate response at eight weeks versus two weeks, but we don't really know what is the appropriate um, interval. And there have been a lot of um, retrospective studies and NCDB studies saying that, you know, you can go longer than eight weeks, but there might be higher rates of um, surgical complications, so it's not really clear, and these are all, you know, retrospective studies. So this study was just published two years ago. It's the uh, uh, French study, the GRECAR-6 trial. Um, that was looking at um, evaluating seven versus an 11, 11 weeks after, after chemo radiation to do surgery. And this was standard, just pre-op chemo radiation followed by surgery. Um, and they looked at uh, 265 patients, locally advanced uh, rectal cancer. They found that there was no difference in pathologic complete response rates between the two groups. Um, but they did find that there was a slightly higher rate of what, we, what were medical complications um, in the 11-week group. So it wasn't surgical complications like wound dehiscence or reoperation, but things like PE and some other medical complications. Also, um, they found that the, there was a worse rate of complete TME, so when they 
took the tumor out and evaluated it pathologically, they didn't have those nice um, complete TMEs in the group that had the um, 11, that waited 11 weeks, which is probably there was just more fibrosis at that point. So probably we're still, for patients that have standard pre-op chemo radiation followed by surgery, that six to eight weeks is probably the right timing. However, now there's a lot of interest, again, in using that upfront chemo, but potentially using it after the chemo radiation with the idea that as you lengthen the time out, add the chemo in there um, to surgery, you're getting additional response. And so this was a study that Julio Garcia Aguilar uh, did um, looking at um, adding chemo after chemo radiation and continuing to increase the timing and the additional chemo that was given. And so each group, you'll see on the bottom, received um, either just standard chemo radiation or increasing amounts of full FOX after chemo radiation. You can see here that the pathologic complete response rate really increased significantly as you went for added more chemo and lengthened the time to surgery. Um, so this is another potential TNT approach. And I'll show you in a minute that this is one of the um, arms on a non-operative management study. Because um, we don't know if really um, adding more time to the chemo radiation, again, in the, this previous Grecar study, it didn't seem to increase in any of the um, pathologic complete response rate uh, uh, outcomes, but possibly by adding the chemo, you can really see additional response. The other question that's really recent now is how much chemotherapy is necessary when we're talking about pre-op chemo radiation um, and then the induction chemo for rectal cancer. So this study was just published now and was presented last year at, the, at ASCO. This is the IDEA collaboration, which was six trials, all looking at the idea of using three versus six months of chemotherapy in the adjuvant setting for colon cancer. But there was one study that included rectal cancer. Um, so our typical uh, approach for rectal cancer is four months of full FOX. Uh, either before or after uh, the, the surgery. And then we also give the five weeks of concurrent capecitabine or 5-FU. So is that, could that be too much? Many of our rectal cancer patients only have stage two disease. So possibly there's, you know, we're over treating some of these patients and we could potentially get away with the only three months. The, the IDEA trial showed that for um, patients receiving KPOX in a low risk setting with stage three disease, you could potentially get um, non-inferior outcomes. So this is another question that's coming up and I think is being discussed um, in, uh, at the uh, NCCN as to whether we can actually consider three months um, for, rather than four months for rectal cancer. Um, so now moving on to the sort of the meat of the, the talk, which is really, what about non-operative management? I mean, this is really kind of a game changer in rectal cancer. When I first started, I would never ever have imagined that there would be a surgeon that would consider non-operative management for rectal cancer. Um, and really, it, this had to come from the surgeons. This was something that at Sloan Kettering, our colorectal surgeons really took the lead with. And this has been, in terms of the national studies, it's really been led by colorectal surgeons. And I think that's great. Um, so the question is, can surgery be avoided in the setting of a complete clinical response to preoperative treatment? And so we know that you know, if patients respond to preoperative therapy, they do better. So these are, these are the data from the um, German rectal study showing that clinical staging on the left-hand side really is not predictive of outcome, whereas the YP or the pathologic staging was much more predictive and, and correlates nicely with outcome. So clearly, response to treatment is highly, highly prognostic for outcome. So I think when we see that patients have good responses, that's probably an opportunity to potentially um, minimize therapy in some ways because they're lower risk. We also know that um, in terms of both local recurrence and disease-free survival, that response is associated. So this is, these are the tumor regression grades, so what, the, what it looked like under the microscope um, in terms of the uh, complete response, which is the grade four versus minimal response, grade zero and one, that patients had a higher local recurrence and a worse disease-free survival, both distant and local, um, if they didn't respond as well. So this really leads us to this idea, can we consider rectal cancer more like we treat anal cancer? If we're able to get good responses in these patients, um, can we really consider uh, after preoperative chemo radiation or induction chemo followed by ke uh, chemo radiation, can we uh, think of this as definitive therapy and avoid surgery? Um, and there's, you know, real rationale for avoiding surgery, particularly for our low-lying rectal cancer patients who might need a, a permanent colostomy. 
Um, there's surgical complications in um, a, a large minority of patients. Perioperative mortality can be up to 3%. Um, we talked about uh, permanent stoma, impaired bowel function, and some late complications, which can be pretty difficult in terms of urinary incontinence, sexual dysfunction. So is surgery always necessary? And if you're looking in and see something that looks like this after preoperative therapy, do you really need to do the full surgery? So that's the ongoing question, and actually, you know, even over 10 years ago, we have data from the Bra uh, Brazilian group looking at potentially avoiding surgery in patients that have this clinical complete response. Um, you know, these data are retrospective, and of course, because it wasn't done in the United States, we didn't want to believe it, but um, they looked at a large number of patients who were treated with chemoradiation. They had 99 that had this clinical complete response, and I'll talk a little bit more about some of the details about what they what, how to assess that. So that's 27%. They followed these patients for five years. There was a 5% local recurrence rate, and the vast majority of patients were um, uh, salvaged with either uh, surgery or brachytherapy. And the five-year overall survival was 93%. More recently, they've published updated prospective data looking at um, now a, a standardized regimen of chemoradiation and then assessment at 10 weeks, and then they kind of um, divide them into complete response versus incomplete response and then follow them uh, for another 12 months and then have another assessment and they decide and then de decide whether they have to do surgery or not. So they have some nice data on when patients recur. There were a few patients that recurred um, during that 12-month uh, period and then they had some patients that had late re local recurrences. But overall, about 50% of patients in this group avoided rectal resection. So that's pretty impressive. The Dutch also have been doing some nice work looking at a cohort study of patients over uh, about 10 year period who were treated with upfront chemoradiation or short course. They were evaluated, now they were using MRI more standardly and endoscopy and all the and if patients had a clinical complete response or a near complete response and they uh, define this as no residual tumor or fibrosis on MRI and only a small residual or no findings on, um, or scar on endoscopy and no palpable tumor on digital rectal exam. And they found in the first group, the first um, publication, they found 11% of their patients fulfilled these criteria. And then they subsequently reported on 100 patients who followed this paradigm. And I'm just showing what those, you know, what it had to look like. So this is an example of what the MRI and the endoscopic exam look like pre-treatment. And you can see that little um, T is where the tumor is. And now you have that nice thin wall in the MRI. The tumor is completely not visible, no lymph nodes. And you have that nice just flat scar on the um, endoscopic evaluation. And that's really what we want to see. And so this is what they showed in their outcomes. So there was um, the WW is watch and wait. Those were the patients who were immediately included. And then you had a delayed inclusion. And then on the left-hand side, you have a group of patients that had some residual, but they underwent a um, transanal endoscopic mucosal resection. Um, and so about nine of the 15 patients actually did have a pathologic complete response, and the other six had uh, still tumor remnant. And what they showed was that there were only 15 uh, patients who had local regrowth, either in the uh, lumen or in a lymph node. Um, and three of the 15 were in that group of patients that had the TEM. And they all had the YPP2 disease. So they were ones that still had um, residual tumor. It was T2 when they evaluated it. Um, and 12 of the 13 were salvaged with just standard uh, surgery, and just one needed a, a pelvic exoneration. So really what they recommended from this was that this is, watch and wait is a viable treatment option for patients. But when you have a patient who has a TEM and has a YPT2 disease, that should, they should go on to radical resection, not, not um, follow uh, with watch and wait. Um, and these are just the outcomes in terms of their survival, excellent survival, um, disease-free survival was 81%. Um, the three-year overall survival was 97%. So these patients are doing very, very well. And then I'll just mention this Danish trial, which did a little more of an aggressive approach. Um, this is, they were go doing non-operative management. These were patients who were generally not good surgical candidates, um, and they were doing uh, a very high dose of chemoradiation, 60 gray to the primary tumor, um, and then a 5 gray brachy boost. Um, and so they had a, initially uh, uh, 55 patients, 51 that received chemoradiation, 40 that had the complete response and went um, under what observation, and there were only nine local recurrences um, 
and so they had about 15% local recurrence rate. And they reported a very low rate of toxicity. But I would imagine if you follow these patients longer, when you're getting 60 gray plus a 5 gray brachy boost, they're going to have some rectal dysfunction down the line. So while this is interesting, I think it's not necessarily applicable to what we want to be doing. Um, and at Sloan Kettering, we had been doing this um, uh, you know, potential non-operative management in many of our patients, or watch and wait approach in many of our patients off protocol. And this really started right when I got there in um, about 2007. The surgeons would call me and be like, well, there doesn't look like there's anything on exam. Do you want, should we just follow this patient? And I almost fell over because I couldn't imagine a surgeon not wanting to do surgery. But we started doing this. And you know, this is, these are the uh, results of a, um, a review of all of the patients that were treated at Memorial Sloan Kettering from 2006 to 2013. Um, about 16% uh, of the patients underwent um, non-operative management, and then um, we had another 16% that had surgery and had a pathologic complete response, and then you had the rest of the patients, 67%, that went to surgery and had not, did not have a pathologic complete response. So we wanted to compare the outcomes of our best responders, the PASCR patients that we knew were PASCRs, to our cl clinical complete responders. So with the median follow-up of what we presented in uh, 2015 of 19 months, and now they're hopefully going to be uh, uh, updating that information this, this year, um, 54 had no local regrowth, and only 19 had local regrowth. So there's 26% at anywhere between 3 to 38 months after the chemo radiation. And we were evaluated in about six weeks. So they were evaluated at six weeks to see if they had clinical complete response. Um, and then 16 were, um, 16 responded in the mucosa or in the tumor area, and three had a nodal recurrence. And so you have to really keep an eye out because there are some that you just endoscopically you wouldn't see. You had to really identify this on um, imaging. And of those patients, they were all um, salvaged either with TME or a local excision. And you can see here, 72% of the patients had a sustained clinical complete response at four years. So we were able to avoid surgery in 72% of these patients. Um, and this is just showing the outcomes uh, so to date um, for the non-operative versus the pathologic complete response patients. And so you can see that you know, the patients who um, had uh, non-operative management, there were a higher rate of uh, local recurrence but those patients were primarily salvaged. Just one thing I want to point out is that if they had a local recurrence, there was also a higher rate of distant recurrence. Now, is that because they had higher risk tumors to begin with and they, that they would be um, you know, higher rate to, of distant metastasis? Or was it because we left the tumor behind and they potentially developed distant metastasis? And that's what we really don't know. That's the big thing that we worry about is that if we don't get complete response, could you potentially seed distant metastases if you leave the tumor there. So that's why I still think this is something that should be considered as, as experimental, and we primarily try to do this on study. Um, here are the disease-free survival and um, overall survival or disease-specific survival. It's only 10% uh, dead of, can of cancer at four years. <clears throat> but always the problem is we, it's hard to predict what a, who has a pathologic complete response. So we you know, try to equate a clinical complete response with a pathologic complete response, but we really can't. Um, and surgery is still the only reliable means to assess that. Um, and you know, there are all kinds of things that we're doing, DRE, you know, endoscopic assessment, EUS, MRI, PET, but really none of them are that accurate. And the sensitivity and specificity, especially after chemo radiation, is not great. Also, when we try to biopsy these patients in the post-chemo radiation setting, it's very difficult to interpret. We just really don't know. Even a few viable cells, do we know is that really um, you know, significant? Is that something that's going to cause recurrence? And a negative biopsy, of course, could be sampling error. So this is a really tough area. We really need, this is where we really need to um, hone in on, on our ability to improve our predictive power in the post-chemo radiation setting. Um, the other problem is looking at nodal staging even, or nodal eva evaluation, even baseline determining whether a node is involved um, before treatment is really difficult, and certainly after treatment, it's even more difficult. And then we know that even in patients that have a pathologic complete response, in this study from Sloan Kettering, 7% of those patients who had a PASCR in the primary tumor still had a positive lymph node. So we can't even make, you know, make conjectures based on you know, the, the response in the primary. So I think you know, because there is so much uncertainty with what we do in terms of evaluating patients after chemoradiation, um, and, and making these predictions, 
this, was, this study was developed and it's just finished accrual about, about a year ago, I'd say, and we're going to start seeing some results soon. And this was a study looking at non-operative management for rectal cancer and incorporated into the study was a really nice um, randomization. And so when I was at Sloan Kettering, we were primarily doing the induction chemo followed by chemo radiation approach. And then Julio Garcia Aguilar came and he had published on that other approach of upfront chemo radiation followed by chemotherapy. So we decided we'd randomize patients to, to the two options, the two sequencing um, options, and then restage. And then if they had a clinical, either partial or complete response, we had put them on a non-operative management pathway. And so that study um, completed accrual. It was led by Memorial Sloan Kettering. We had a, you know, multiple um, institutions that were um, accruing onto the study. It's about, I think, about 250 patients total. Um, and I think another thing that, you know, we did had a very standardized um, post treatment evaluation. And I, I put this one up here because this is the one that came from uh, the recent Habergama study from Brazil that it's, you really have to have good follow-up. Patients have to be compliant in order to really allow them to go on these types of studies. Um, so you can see there's a lot of uh, clinical assessments, radiologic assessments. We were doing MRI on the, on the study at every six months for the first two years. Um, and to really make sure that we're not putting them at higher risk of recurrence that is not salvageable. And these are just some of the um, forms that were in the, uh, the rectal study, from the non-operative management study from Memorial, just showing what you had to really define what are we looking for in terms of clinical complete response. So we have endoscopy, we have, you check off the um, gastroenterologist or your surgeon, whoever's doing the, um, the flex sig has to really evaluate all of these, these things, digital rectal exam, there are specific criteria for the MRI. So I think that's really important, and that's part of what's coming out of the study is how, what are we using to assess clinical complete response. And this is the study that's being proposed to follow on, be the follow-on study from that non-operative management study that's hopefully going to be open through the alliance. And there's discussion now in the, ta in the rectal uh, task force as to how to uh, push this forward to, um, to get this open. Um, so this is, again, looking at this idea of the two options of um, either induction chemo followed by chemo radiation or chemo radiation followed by chemo, and then assessing patients, and then um, if they're a clinical responder, then they go on to watch and wait. And they'll be comparing those outcomes. Um, they'll randomize on um, of the two induction regimens, but compare the overall outcomes for all patients who are, go on watch and wait with the standard approach, which was um, chemo radiation, TME, and adjuvant chemo. Another interesting trial that's also looking at sort of a non-operative or you know, less uh, uh, avoiding radical resection is an ECOG trial that's being um, reviewed, which is looking at upfront chemo followed by full thickness excision and then um, chemo radiation afterwards. This is for an earlier stage group of patients, node negative by MRI. So there are a lot of new things coming down the, in, in the horizon to evaluate some of these new approaches. I just want to say a few words about short course uh, radiation because I think there's sort of gaining interest in using um, short course, which really hasn't been used in the United States um, you know, over the last 20, 30 years. This is really a European, northern European approach. Um, so we have data from the Dutch looking at pre-op um, short course, 25 gray times uh, in five fractions, followed by a week break, followed by surgery uh, versus surgery alone, and this showed a decrease in local recurrence rates. Um, but what's what was interesting, there were a lot more uh, early stage patients that were um, enrolled on that study, so there were some, you know, uh, two, uh, stage one patients, which we would not have treated in the United States. But when they did their 10-year follow-up in an unplanned subgroup analysis, pre-op radiation actually did yield an overall survival benefit at 10 years um, in a specific subset. This is not a pre-planned analysis, so you really can't, you know, this is not a, a, a take-home, um, you know, final uh, outcome that we can really report, but it's sort of a hypothesis generating outcome that there, in that stage three group of patients with negative circumferential margins, there was a, um, a survival benefit, 50% versus 40%. So that's pretty impressive. Um, so that certainly suggests that in the higher risk patients, if we're really to focus on those patients, this approach is, um, is effective and may even imp impact on survival. So just recently, last year, the um, Stockholm 3 trial was reported, and this was actually comparing um, pre-op short course, followed by a week, followed by surgery, pre-op 
uh, the short course followed by six weeks and then surgery, or long course chemo radiation and then six weeks and then surgery, to look at both whether you improve pathologic complete response by increasing the time from uh, the short course to surgery and just seeing what the outcomes were. And this was a large study, over 800 patients um, from across Sweden. They had a couple different, depending on the institution they were at, they got randomized either to the three arm or two arm, just a short course. And these are res the results that were published showing that in terms of local recurrence, distant recurrence, there was no difference in outcomes, survival, there was absolutely no difference between any of the three groups. Um, so, you know, really for in Europe, justifying the approach of, of short course, which, um, you know, for many patients, is, at least now that I'm in Colorado, has some merit because my patients are coming from like, you know, Wyoming and coming for five weeks of chemo radiation is not always that easy. So it's nice to have these data to, to support the use of short course um, when necessary. And really, uh, interestingly, no increase in post-op complication rate when you had the short course and delay to surgery, which was always a concern when you wait out six weeks for, you know, that timing when you have that higher dose per fraction didn't seem to increase uh, post-op complications. Um, the other thing that I thought was neat, so these are just showing, again, the graphs, no difference between the groups, but in the short course delay, right, the six weeks or so to surgery, the past year act rate was actually up to almost 12%. So um, typically in the, in the uh, initial studies, there really wasn't a path CR rate at all, maybe 1% to 2% if you did short course and then wait a week and then surgery. But if you do wait, you do see a higher rate of path CR. The, Polish, uh, the recent Polish study now looks at a uh, short course followed by chemo, followed by surgery. And this study was uh, published two years ago. Um, and they compared it to standard chemo radiation followed by TME. And there was, um, you know, there's been some speculation about why there was an improvement in survival, but there was an improvement in survival for the patients that received uh, short course plus chemotherapy versus standard chemo radiation, probably because they weren't getting adjuvant chemo. So the only full FOX they were receiving was um, on this one arm um, in, the, in the short, that short interval. So um, this was certainly an interesting study, although we, we still tend not to believe things that come from outside of the US. Um, the Rapido trial should be, I think it may be um, presented this year at ASCO, and this was again a study looking at the same idea, chemo radiation followed by surgery versus, um, if possible, these were patients that had very locally advanced disease, um, versus short course and then chemo and then evaluation and resection. Um, so I think this is a really nice option, particularly for our stage four patients. When you have a patient with a resectable liver lesion, you don't want to put them on long course chemo radiation uh, for five, five weeks and you know, then a delay to getting to surgery. Um, I think this is a really nice option to do that short course and um, get the chemo in and then not delay any of the systemic therapy. So we sometimes do this for our, our resectable liver lesion patients, or we start with induction chemo and then short course and then surgery. So are, we, are people using um, short course in the US? So this was a study that we did looking at, um, we uh, wanted to identify, given all of the changes over the last few years in rectal um, treatments, uh, we wanted to look at appropriateness of certain types of uh, uh, approaches in various clinical settings. And so this was using um, expert opinion and uh, the, the um, existing data. But what we did was we went out and we asked um, a expert panel about when certain things would be appropriate, and we looked specifically at the new adjuvant short course, and we gave certain clinical scenarios. And for the most part, depend, you know, this is showing different risk categories, distance from the anal verge, distance of the tumor from the mesorectal fascia. Um, for the most part, um, our expert panel rated um, short course as being either appropriate or maybe appropriate in the vast majority. So there's starting to be more uptake of this approach. Still not the standard thing, but it's, you know, it's being done. So I think we've really come to a nice, you know, emerging therapeutic model for uh, rectal cancer, which is neoadjuvant chemo or, and, you know, or vice versa between these two um, approaches, neoadjuvant chemo followed by chemo radiation, um, and then assessment of response. If they have a clini no clinical complete response, they go directly to surgery. If they do have a clinical complete response, we can do non-operative management, um, especially if we're you know, essentially doing these on study right now. But the big thing is we really have to do a better job of response assessment. Um, and so this is where I think we really need to focus our research. Functional imaging may be a nice approach. Other biomarkers, we really need to identify those. 
I also think this is a nice opportunity, as with the GI002 study, for looking at new agents. And this is a nice opportunity, as we've, hear, we've heard from Christina Wu, that you can really do these investigator-initiated trials to really look at whether we can improve outcomes either by adding targeted agents, immunotherapy, radiation dose escalation, um, you know, in this new adjuvant setting. So I think this is a real opportunity for us to, to get involved. So just in conclusion, I think, you know, preoperative chemo radiation still remains the standard of care, it's still on the NCCN guidelines, that's what we do. It, we know that it reduces uh, local recurrence risk and allows for sphincter preservation in our locally advanced patients, especially with those with low-lying tumors. Um, there may be this role of selective radiation um, after response to induction chemotherapy, but we need the validation from the prospect trial for this. Um, but in our high-risk patients, we really still need to approach this with trimodality therapy and total, um, the use of total neoadjuvant therapy may allow us, though, to avoid surgery in the patients that have a clinical complete response. Because even if they have what looks like a more advanced tumor, if they respond to treatment, we know those patients do better. So that's really a better litmus test than really the pre-op staging. Um, and in terms of non-operative management, I think it's uh, potentially an option for our distal rectal, rectal cancers in a very highly selected group. Um, and, but still should be, you know, considered to be something that's experimental. Um, and now we're trying to do some of these other approaches to intensify therapy to improve the pretest probability that you're going to have a pathologic complications, whether it's induction or consolidative chemotherapy with the radi with chemo radiation, increasing radiation dose per the Danish uh, study, or adding new radiosensitizers, targeted agents, and immunotherapy. And again, this prediction of pathologic complete response is a challenge. Um, we just need to really find better combinations of both imaging and molecular biomarkers to help us improve the accuracy. Um, we will hopefully improve the um, combinations of therapy with this GI002 trial to improve our pathologic complete response rates um, so that we can make this option of non-operative management um, viable for patients with low-lying rectal tumors. But we really need to have a multidisciplinary approach. And I think that's really um, the emphasis with rectal cancer and why I think it's so important for our rectal cancer patients to be seen in, in academic settings where you have multidisciplinary care. Um, we need to have our surgeons, our medical oncologists, our radiation oncologists, gastroenterologists, and radiologists all involved in evaluating these patients. Um, and still, I think, in, for the most part, these, should be, uh, these patients should be treated in the setting of a clinical trial or as we're starting to work on now at University of Colorado, a very well-developed program of close follow-up. So we're really tracking these patients um, and then the clear communication that patients need to comply with these follow-up schedules because they can't just go off into oblivion. We need to follow them. Um, so I think as we improve our ability to individualize care for rectal cancer patients, we want to maintain our cure rates. But I think ultimately now we're doing quite well with rectal cancer, and our goal is also to improve quality of life for these patients. So I'd like to give some time for questions, and thank you for your attention. My, my new view in Colorado. Yeah, thanks. Uh, do you think uh, immunoscore has a possible role in rectal cancer uh, health cancer model? Well, I'm not familiar with the details of immunoscore, but I know that, um, you know, certainly as we're looking at the, you know, if you look in the, at, at the um, patients that have higher rates of TLs, those patients tend to do better. So I don't know, but I certainly think those are our patients that tend to do better. And the immunoscore would certainly be a prognostic, it, it's known to be prognostic for those patients in terms of the, um, the response rates. We know that our, you know, I didn't go into um, any of the details about when we're using immunotherapy in our patients uh, with uh, the MSI high, which is our really, um, you know, those patients do incredibly well in terms of uh, response to um, immunotherapy. But, you know, we looked a little bit at whether uh, patients with Lynch in general did better with radiation. We looked at a study with, um, when I was leaving Sloan Kettering, we had a group of patients that had been treated with pre-op chemo radiation that had Lynch. And those patients looked like they had really ugly tumors, and they tended to respond pretty well, but they didn't have a higher pathologic complete response rate, which was interesting. I was surprised about that. But, um, but I think those types of, I don't know the details of the immunoscore per se, but those types of things are probably going to be helpful in, in combining that with other things to look at um, potential for response. Yeah. 
Mylan. So in terms of the uh, genomic signatures, so that has been one of the difficult things to assess because, um, first of all, at Sloan Kettering, we tried to look at that. But the problem is the PATH-CR patients don't have any tissue left when they go to surgery, so we don't have anything to look at. We can look at predictors of poor response, but we, can, we haven't really had a good way to evaluate the um, good responders, although they were getting better about getting pre-op um, or, or pre-treatment biopsies, but are, interestingly enough, the, um, when we tried to go back and look at some of the uh, pre-treatment biopsies, and you don't have a lot of tissue a lot of times, it's not great for assessing, um, and, some, and many of our patients were biopsied on the outside and things like that. So we didn't, so that was something that they were trying to look at. There's not a great, you know, specific uh, panel or, you know, signature that we can really say that is gonna be predicting for uh, pathologic complete response. So that, that's what we're hoping to do with the GI002 study. In fact, so there are several institutions that are called TNT Plus, and we're putting in all of our um, tissue, both the pretreatment as well as the uh, surgical specimens, so that we can look for those types of things. You know, I, I have to say, it's interesting having, you know, I'm sure, um, you know, Europe has some different uh, forces at play in terms of why they do things. The U.S., we've sort of had our standard approach of long-course chemoradiation. Um, I think we, there's no data for a middle ground, but that could be a potential um, evaluation of what can we do to, um, you know, it, combined with chemo, maybe, you know, the way that we did, you know, the, the group at MD Anderson was doing 300 times 10 plus chemo for pre-op for pancreas as, a, as an option. Where I'm seeing patients now, there is a subgroup of patients who are really coming from, you know, really far away. We're the only large academic center in a multi-state radius. So um, there are more patients where that really would help if I didn't have to put them through five, and five weeks of treatment. Um, I think it's certainly something that, um, you know, is a, could be a nice happy medium to look at something that's a little bit longer course. Short course, though, I, I found, you know, generally um, the surgeons and everybody with the uh, reports that are coming out are more open to it. So in my patients where I feel that that's, that's helpful or they have, you know, M1 disease where we want to get them to surgery quickly, we're using short course more and more. So I, I think it's starting to get into the, um, uh, into the sort of standard approach, but it's still not, I mean, in many places it, that people are a little nervous about it just because, and I think a lot of this comes from the fact that we have a lot of long-term data where the, you, you know, the, the Scandinavians, the Dutch have done a great job of tracking their patients long-term, so we actually have long-term, um, you know, uh, late effect studies, whereas in the U.S. we just haven't published on that because we just haven't looked at it. I'm sure it's not going to be all that different between the small bowel obstruction rate in a short course patient versus a long course patient. So, Yeah, I mean, I think I, I see a lot of young patients, um, both when I was at Sloan Kettering and at, at uh, University of Colorado, because they tend to travel. They'll come to a big academic center. So we see a lot of them. And, and there is a really, you know, alarming, overall, for patients over 50, there's a decrease in, in the incidence of colorectal cancer, um, possibly due to better screening and things. But this increase in the young patients is alarming. And um, I think that these patients really benefit from multi-modality assessment. And so we, you know, I tried in my younger women patients to try to avoid radiation if possible, because obviously, you know, if you could avoid putting them into menopause or affecting fertility, these are really important things to, um, you know, that have long-term impacts on, on patients. So I think, you know, de-escalation of certain 
uh, treatments. Also, some of our patients who, you know, who have a clinical complete response, um, if we could avoid, you know, especially the low-lying rectal patients, if we could avoid surgery in those patients, I mean, the impact on their long-term, you know, their, their life expectancy is hopefully going to be good once, the, you know, they get through the treatment, and to reduce the impact on their quality of life is really important. So, you know, doing the same old, you know, upfront chemoradiation surgery, adjuvant chemo, you know, for these patients is probably, we need to think more critically for those patients in particular. But you also don't want to, um, you know, potentially reduce or, or impact their risk of cure. So really having the ability to do the chemo up front, look at how they respond, you know, reassess. We oftentimes will, you know, we, we do the chemo and we reassess after chemo, see how they're responding. If it's a really young patient, we sometimes I'll consider not doing radiation. Um, but if it's somebody that, you know, there's any concern, I still push it and, you know, we do ovarian transposition for our younger patients to avoid impact on the, on the ovaries for not, not so much for fit, fertility, but for um, hormonal function. Um, but yeah, it's, it, that is becoming a bigger issue is how do we um, maintain the cure rates in these young patients but really minimize the risk of late effects. It's a great question. So there, I mean, I think we're learning that there is definitely an impact of, you know, right versus left colon and all that. So probably, you know, we're falling, rectum falls more, more into left-sided uh, colon. And so probably there's some um, effect of uh, um, predisposing effect to maybe even toxicity from chemotherapy, depending on, um, you know, issues with the microbiome. One of the things that I don't necessarily work so much with um, the microbiome per se in terms of prognostic features, but I would say when we know that when we radiate and give chemotherapy, we're impacting the microbiome. And so many of our patients after treatment have um, long-term effects in terms of their bowel functions. And so a lot of work is being done to look at whether we can improve bowel function by addressing the microbiome. And probably there's going to be some interesting work there. Thank you, everybody, for your attention.